I'm glad to be here. I am deeply glad to be here. This, this right here, this represents not the 1%. This represents the one-tenth of one-tenth of 1% 1 of all the pilots in the world. There's hundreds of thousands of pilots. There's tens of thousands of tactical jet pilots. Only six of us got to wear this helmet. And three of us were new every year. A third of my support team was new every year. Talk about change. I mean, every week I'm in a different location. Sometimes I'm over land, sometimes over water. Sometimes the weather's good, sometimes the weather's bad. So we not only had to adapt to change, we had to lead through change. So how do you do that? Well, I think what this helmet represents and how we did it was with the culture. And I will suggest this. It was a culture of excellence and a culture of caring. And we all know you need that second part. See, it's not enough just to be excellent at what you do. You gotta care and you gotta care deeply. So I get a, a question a lot. I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you think of the Blue Angels, what comes to mind? What's the first word that comes to mind? I get words like precision, excellence, teamwork. But what usually gets shouted out first is awe. It's just amazing. So how do you create awe? You ever think about that? How do you create awe in your life? Well, we did it on the Blue Angels. We did it every single day. But how do you transfer that back into what you do every single day? And I think it starts with a glad to be here mindset. To me, that is the essence of how do you create awe. I think back to my first flight. So I just got selected for the Blues. And the boss walked up to me that day and he goes, hey Gucci, you wanna go flying today? So Gucci's my call sign. Let me give you a first clue. You don't get to pick it. And if you like it, it doesn't stick, okay? <laughs> but I never forget that feeling when I strapped into that cockpit and I wore this helmet for the first time. It was in front of an air show, so the electricity was in the air. And then we lowered the canopies. And as the canopy came down, like a vacuum, you focus. We're taxiing out to the runway. The little hairs are starting to stand up all over my arms and my back and my neck. I mean, I had thousands of hours in the F-18, but this is different. This is the Blue Angels. I'd been an instructor pilot, I'd flown in the movie Top Gun, but I'm surrounded by greatness now. We taxi out onto the runway. The boss says, run them up. That's 128,000 pounds of thrust. Next thing he says is, off brakes now, burners ready now. We leap into the air. The pilot does this violent left wing down. We go slicing underneath the wind tip of the number two jet. The next thing I know, we're tucked in underneath the afterburners of the boss. Now, you know how loud those jets are when they go overhead? Can you imagine being 36 inches underneath this? I'm telling you. <laughs> The flames are coming out, the airplane's shaking, there's metal all around me, these guys start going straight up. My eyes got this big, and the thought that hit me, how am I gonna do this? See, what the Blue Angels were saying to me that day was this. They were saying, John Foley, you wanna play in this game? You need to increase your performance 300%. We as a team and an organization are gonna increase our performance 300%, and guess what? You have three months to do it in. That's the training cycle of a Blue Angel. Now, I haven't been put through that process and mindset that I call glad to be here. It's possible to transfer that. You know, I think uh, I get a question too a lot, but what do you remember most? You know, what do you remember most about being Blue Angel? You know, is it flying here in San Francisco? I mean, I'm blowing through the Golden Gate Bridge. You know what actually I remember from San Francisco? I remember going down Market Street and seeing how many car alarms I could set off. Do I remember that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. But you know what I really remember? Is the look in the little kid's eyes when we got a chance to go to the crowd line. The privilege to sign an autograph. I'll never forget it, the first chance I got to do that. I mean, I'm pretty exhausted. I just flown a, a 37 minute air show. I've lost about six pounds of sweat, but I'm walking up the crowd line and this little girl, she's jumping all up and down. And what I saw in her eyes was this look of hopes and dreams. And what hit me that second is it's not about me. See, it's not about John Foley at all. The only reason that little girl truly cared about having my autograph had actually very little to do about me, but everything to do about what this helmet stood for. Everything to do about the blue flight suit. And I remember feeling something in my heart that day. I think we've all felt this. I hope we feel it right now. 
And that's a deep commitment, an obligation to something that's larger than yourself. See, this purpose larger than yourself, I believe, is where our energy comes from. It's what allows us to get up every day and want and make a commitment to help other people. So my journey after this changes like this. I go back to the Navy. I'm flying jets on aircraft carriers. And just like you, uh, I get a career choice. Do I continue on this path or do I take a harder path? A path of reinventing myself. So I chose the hard path. I know a lot of you right now are making those same decisions. So I actually go to Stanford Business School, ended up getting three master's degrees. I'm working in venture capital. So I'm in Silicon Valley right around 2000, 2001. Anybody remember what happened then? Yeah, this old bubble. We call it the dot-com bubble. And I remember sitting around the room that day going, what are we gonna do? And a thought hits my head. How come? Now my question was not how come the bubble burst. Here was my question. How come some people outperform others and some don't? How come some teams outperform others and some don't? How come some organizations consistently outperform, are the best? And then a thought hit me here. How did the best get better? So I started thinking about that. It became my passion. For the last two decades, I've been trying to unpack. See, I know how we did it on the Blue Angels, but how do you do it in the real world? So I've had the rare privilege of work with over 1,000 organizations. I do over 100 engagements a year, and I get to learn, and I started to see how this all came together. And it, it comes together with what I call the glad to be here mindset. So what is that? Well, it's a process and a mindset of creating a difference in someone's life. So strategic management theory will teach you this. We all know it. Vision, plan, execute, feedback loop. But in the point of 1%, we think differently, we talk differently, we speak differently. See, we don't talk about vision. What we talk about is beliefs, because that is what you ask. It's what you ask of each other. It's what you ask of your families to believe, to believe in you. So how do you get commitment and buy into belief? And then the brief here is about preparation and focus. The center point is about alignment. How do you get people aligned? More importantly, how can you get yourself aligned and centered? The execution piece is what I call trust, high trust contracts. And then you have a debrief piece here. And this is absolutely critical. There, there's a technique to do this. And if you can do it well, it can make all the difference in the world. So what I call is there five dynamics, five dynamics. The first one is you gotta create a safe environment. The safe environment is respect for each and every person there. The second thing you gotta do is you gotta check your ego at the door. Anybody think fighter pilots got big, big egos? Yeah, you kidding me? But we all have big egos. We had a saying, check your ego at the door. The third one is about openness and honesty. We said lay it on the table. The fourth dynamic is about ownership, accountability. Actually, it's about personal responsibility. See, because when you have personal responsibility, accountability becomes a given. But the fifth and final dynamic is this glad to be here. To me, it's the secret sauce. You see, you gotta have this glad to be here because then what that does is you get this spiraling up process of high performance. Now, for the last 14 years, working with all these organizations, I've been putting together a manuscript. And I wanna tell you right now, we just finished it two days ago. And what it does, it takes you behind the scenes. We don't even know what the title is yet. It's something about going beyond high performance. It's about this fearless success, the process and a mindset of elite teams. But let me take you into one facet right now. Let's concentrate on one facet. And I wanna talk about focus. Why? Because if you can learn how to focus your mind, you have real power. So there's a lot of science lately about our human brain. We're learning tremendously about how the brain works. So it turns out, every time I snap my fingers, 65 frames hit your eyeballs. We cannot multitask. The human brain cannot focus on two things at one time. But because you get 65 chances a second, you think you're multitasking, you're not. You're doing the same thing I was doing in my jet. When I was flying 500 miles per hour, 100 feet off the ground, inverted. I got an opposing jet coming at me at over 1,000 miles per hour closer. That means every second we're going four football fields. And then I can look down at my two mile checkpoint and I see the green shade of a window. How do you do that? <laughs> well, here's the beautiful part, we all can do it. The human brain is much more powerful than we think. There is a way and a process to do that. But it starts with this idea of frames. 
So you gotta be able to slow the frames down. You have to be able to block out distractions. Anybody in this room got any distractions in their lives? Yeah, you kidding me? So how do you block out distractions? Here's how you do it, two quick techniques. You gotta focus down into what I call a single point of focus. But if you stay there too long, that's a problem. You have to open up your aperture and the awareness. So what it is, is it's a, it's a repetition, it's habituation of focusing down and opening up. Hebb's Law, Hebb's Law says this. It says the neurons in our brain that wire together, fire together. That's where habits come from. That's where we get what we call unconscious competence, where you're in a state where you could actually do this. Now we all can do this. I'm gonna give you a tool right now, and, and we're gonna make it fun, all right? How many of you like to wake up happy? I like, I like to wake up happy. Anybody else in this room? Okay, so here's the question. Do you? Do you wake up happy every single day? You can train your brain to wake up happy. I'll share it with you right now. There's a lot of different studies that have been on happiness. And what we found is the number one quality of happy people is gratitude. Turns out gratefulness is the number one quality. So when I heard that, here's what I did. I do what I call my glad to be here wake up. You can try this tomorrow morning. I do it every single morning. The very first thing I do when I wake up, I just say, what am I grateful for? Now today was easy because you all hit my head. I said, you know, later on in the evening, I'm gonna get the rare privilege to share some information with others who have a chance to make a difference in someone else's life. That's a privilege, I'm grateful for that. And then of course, I feel healthy, I feel strong today, I'm thankful for that. But then here's the other thing, that's the present. Then go back, go back 24 hours. Now you can go back as far as you want in your life. I just go back 24 hours because I do this every single day. And think about what happened yesterday. But think about people, their faces and the smiles. Then go forward in your day. Most people forget to do this, but you go forward in your day and you think about others, not just yourself. It turns out, if you do that about 40 to 65 times, we really don't know, you will cut grooves in your brain. The neuroplasticity of your brain changes. You start to have more happy thoughts. Don't believe me. Try it. See, that's the glad to be her mindset. When you can habituate this, it's amazing what can happen. So I've got a passion in life now. I don't know if you can feel it right now, but my passion is to spread this glad to be here all over the world. And so what we're doing is uh, we started, in fact, I gave you stickers. Right now, everybody looks down. You saw those stickers, those hashtag glad to be here stickers. Go to the next slide. What you'll see here is I want you to put this somewhere. I want you to put this sticker somewhere to remind you why you're grateful, why you do what you do. I put it on my cell phone because I pick it up all the time. But we've got this movement that started and people all over the world are sending me pictures of the Glad to Be Here sticker. And if you want to join this movement, all you have to do is go to gladtobehere.com. I got all kinds of special stuff that you can do. But I want you to be part of what Gandhi said. Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the light. And I say let's do that by planting the seeds of gratefulness and gratitude. Now this all came home to me in a big way very recently. I was at an event, I had just finished, I'm in the back, somebody comes up and they, they put their, their arm around me. And he says this, he says, Gucci, it's been a while since I've seen you. Go to the next picture. This is who he says. He opens up his cell phone and he shows me this picture. Now, this is me in 1990. I know that because I'm number seven. We're in San Francisco. But this is what he says to me. He says, John, I kept this picture above my bed when I was a kid. I kept this picture above my bed when I was in college. His wife was standing next to him. She goes, you're not gonna believe this. He's still got the picture in the living room. <laughs> this is who that is today. That's Blue Angel number three, Nate Scott. Yeah, how cool is that? You know, it, it blows me away, and I'll tell you why it blows me away. Because I don't remember that interaction. That was 28 years ago. It was 60 seconds. And somehow we planted a seed in that child's heart that grew into something pretty powerful. And here's the thing about planting seeds. We all can do this. We all have the opportunity to impact other people's lives. In fact, you get 65 chances a second to plant a seed. So I would suggest this. Plant the seed of gratitude. Plant the seed of gratefulness. Plant the seed 
of glad to be here. And let's go out there and let's inspire a billion people to live a glad to be here life. Thank you very much. Glad to be here.